50 years after their founding and 20 years after the death of lead singer Jerry Garcia, the Grateful Dead remained one of America's most renowned bands. With songs that spanned countless generations beyond just rock and roll, the common perception of the Dead is that their music was full of psychedelic sounds and endless guitar noodling, which is true, but they were also a lot more than that. Here's a look at the untold truth of the Grateful Dead. They started in Palo Alto. San Francisco is synonymous with the Grateful Dead, so it may come as a surprise that the band actually formed in Palo Alto, a quiet college town 35 miles south of San Francisco. Grateful Dead founder Jerry Garcia was born in San Francisco, but he moved to Palo Alto in 1960 after being thrown out of the army and soon became part of the Palo Alto music scene. He'd take me around to all of his friends' places and I'd play, play the blues and people would go, God damn, look at this now my boy play the blues, you know? <laughs> it's great! In Palo Alto, he met songwriter partner Robert Hunter, as well as future Grateful Dead guitarist Bob Weir. These meetings laid the groundwork for the Grateful Dead, but it wasn't until 1966 that the band actually moved to the city by the bay. The Grateful Debs. Garcia and company are infamous for their connections to the hippie counterculture. They were the house band for author Ken Kesey, whose LSD field acid tests were immortalized in Tom Wolfe's classic 1968 book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. But in the early days, the dead were happy to take any gig that paid, including a 1966 debutante ball. Naturally, neighbors filed a noise complaint with the cops. Those poor debutantes didn't know what hit them. Viral Marketing Pioneers Viral marketing techniques may seem like an internet thing, but the Grateful Dead helped pioneer the technique a half a century ago by encouraging their fans to make bootleg recordings of their live concerts. It turned out to be a stroke of genius, as their studio albums couldn't really convey the Dead's legendary live improvisation. As a result of fans trading live bootleg albums, a whole culture sprung up around the Grateful Dead's live tours, which even became a way of life for some people. Now that's an effective marketing gimmick. And then the moon came out, and it was like Jerry willed it! Yeah. Come on, Mike. Freak freely, dude. Okay. Ungrateful Dad. In 1967, the Grateful Dead decided to add a second drummer to the group and hired Mickey Hart. That in turn led to them hiring his dad, Lenny Hart, to manage their money. Unfortunately, he was arrested in 1971 for embezzling $77,000 from the band. Mickey ended up taking a leave of absence before rejoining the group in 1974. Painful as the incident was, though, it gave them good fodder for their music, as it inspired the song, He's Gone. Steal your face, right off your head. So at least they got something for their money. Garcia was in a Richard Nixon commercial. One of Richard Nixon's 1968 presidential ads talked about the youth of America, featuring photos of the counterculture. Twelve seconds into the ad, a photo of Jerry Garcia flashes on the screen, leading to decades of confusion. Needless to say, Garcia didn't endorse or vote for Nixon because he didn't believe in voting at all. In 1989, he told Rolling Stone, I don't feel there's anything to vote for yet. Constantly choosing the lesser of two evils is still choosing evil. Pigpen didn't die from drinking. For decades, the story was that keyboardist Ron Pigpen McKernan, who died in 1973, had passed on due to alcoholism. Like his one-time love interest and singing partner Janis Joplin, he was also a member of Rock's infamous 27 Club. But in fact, he had given up alcohol in the year before his death, in part because it was aggravating the congenital autoimmune disease that actually did claim his life. Biliary cirrhosis. Blame them for yogurt. It's everywhere in American supermarkets today, but in the early 1970s, yogurt was a weird niche food. In 1972, Ken Casey's brother Chuck reached out to the band for a little help because of his company, which sold Nancy's Honey Yogurt. The first yogurt in the U.S. with live acidophilus cultures was struggling. The Grateful Dead agreed to stage a benefit concert to keep the yogurt flowing, resulting in the concert film Sunshine Daydream and decades worth of yogurt for everyone, as Nancy's Honey Yogurt is still around today. Yogurt! Yogurt! I hate yogurt! A Long Strange Trip Weir was born in 1947 and was adopted by well-off parents from Atherton, California. His parents died in 1972, but more than a decade later he was contacted by his biological mother. According to Weir, they didn't hit it off, so when she gave him the contact information for his biological father, Weir decided not to track him down. In 1996, though, he finally cold-called his bio dad, a retired Air Force colonel. The two immediately bonded, and Weir soon discovered he had four half-brothers. The oldest of his new brothers, James Lewis Parber, had been a musician himself before his untimely death and had left behind his old battered electric guitar. Weir decided to have the family memento fixed up, and when he did, he discovered it had the exact sound he'd been searching for. Ever since, he's been using his brother's vintage 1956 Fender Telecaster in his shows with the dead. What a long, strange trip for a classic guitar. Altamont changed them forever. 
In December 1969, the Grateful Dead were scheduled to appear as part of the Altamont Music Festival, but after hearing about incidents with the Hells Angels who had been hired as security, the band quit at the last second and hightailed it out of town. It proved to be a fateful decision. Altamont became the most infamous tragedy in rock history, and according to rock historian Joe Selvin, the group responded by leaving mainstream music behind and changing their sound with the folksy 1970 album Working Man's Dead. Hall of Famers the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has a rule that musicians can only become eligible for induction 25 years after the release of their first record. So technically, when the Dead were elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1994, only the original members of the band should have been inducted. But Garcia insisted that everybody in the band had to be inducted, including Robert Hunter, the group's main lyricist. He won that fight, and 12 members of the band were included in the induction in 1994. It was a particularly nice gesture considering Garcia himself didn't care at all for the honor. He didn't even bother attending the ceremony, except as a cardboard cut. Out. Say good night, Jerry. Good night, Jerry. <laughs> Addicted to love. Jerry Garcia died in 1995 at the age of 53 from a heart attack, but it was truly his many addictions that led to his death. Besides going to rehab for cocaine and heroin addiction in 1985, his overeating led to diabetes and a diabetic coma in 1986 that nearly claimed his life. And if that wasn't enough, he was also a heavy smoker. But despite his many health issues, Garcia refused to stop touring even after it became clear that the effort was killing him. Garcia told Rolling Stone that the band had so many employees on their payroll that they couldn't stop touring because it could cause too much financial hardship to the people who relied on them. In fact, according to David Brown's book, So Many Roads, The Life and Times of the Grateful Dead, the band had $750,000 in expenses each month. In the end, then, it was Garcia's generosity that ultimately led to his death. Mickey Hart said in the documentary Long Strange Trip, it shows you how lonely it is when people want to pick you apart and give you no peace just because they love you to death. It's kind of tragic. Rest in peace, Jerry. Thanks for watching. Click the grunge icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.